Welcome to Story Comic Presents, where we interview amazing storytellers and artists. This is episode 305. I'm your host, Barney Smith of StoryComic.com, and we're excited to have with us the highly talented and internationally acclaimed and award-winning author, <laughs> Bart King. Right, and uh, thank you very much. Yeah. And it's my pleasure to announce to the listeners uh, that this episode 305 is the inaugural Bart and Barney rebranding of the show. So we, it can be Barney and Bart, I don't mind. Like it just sounds too cool not to do though, right? Like, I'm sorry, I'm horning in on your franchise. What have I done? I just love the sound of Bart and Barney together so much that it seems like a natural. Um, I know, it's like it's like peanut butter and jelly, see? Right, yeah, just give yeah. us a couple of slices of bread and we're good to go. Um, I beg your pardon, you, there's more to say and I cut you off before you got to it, so I'm sorry. Hi everybody. Oh, no, there's no, I, no, there, no I'm, I, I'm, I'm rambling right now, so yeah, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> perfect that's perfect uh, we have you know i i do know that we both have written dad jokes uh dad joke books i should say um so we're both scholars in our own right and um in anticipation of that low moments ago i was like oh where's my dad joke scoring chart so like in the course of this conversation we should have um different um, itemized reactions so for example on a scale of one to ten audience reaction being, or it's really a scale of a zero to 10. Audience reaction of zero would be no reaction and life content, continues uninterrupted after you make a right. joke, after you tell your joke, in which case what you do as a dead joker is they clearly didn't hear you, so you simply repeat the joke louder. Um, so somewhere <laughs> between that zero and uh, let's see, maybe like a seven, which is a grudging affirmation from the person that was pretty good. Uh, right. At that point, your body releases dopamine if you are, in fact, a joke teller. Um, if we could just like get get to that sweet spot, I mean, we don't have to hit a 10, but I, I'd be right. happy with a 7 on this, yeah. Right. There Sorry. You I, 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 you know, that was unhelpful. I beg your pardon. <laughs> I, I have the full chart here. It's a lot more fun if you can see the chart than, than me. <laughs> so, yeah, is that is that in your book? Do you have the, a dad yeah. joke chart? In it is. I don't think I can attach it to our chat, but maybe I'm wrong. Let's see. No, nope, right. I can't. Um, rats. Well, yeah. I can share it with you later. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Right. Dad jokes, fine. Cool. So you know how you're doing. You know, um, right? So someone yells out, "Delete your account." You know that you're at about a six. Uh, you know when you tell your joke. Yeah. Because they didn't throw their computer away. That would have been. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, uh, I like it when you get to, if you can get to like 8.5, that's where your audience is making credible threats of violence. Uh, and right. then you know you're really delivering the goods. Um, yeah. you know, just keep it, keep stirring that pot. Yeah. Like a heavy eye roll. See, it's just when you know that. <laughs> Yeah. An eye roll that requires a trip to an ophthalmologist. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> I think I sprained my orb. Uh, yeah. What happened while well, this guy was telling the jokes. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about how you started sure. getting into writing as well. Cause you have a veritable library of yeah. um, literature now. I, I think that for me, um, I came to writing late. I hadn't thought of, I would be a writer. So uh, to put things in perspective, um, I, taught middle grade um, social studies, critical thinking, language arts for 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, in the course of doing that, I'd like to um, be doing something creative. And so, for example, since I taught social studies, I thought, well, what I should do is work on my version of a research project when the kids do theirs. And so that led to getting a master's in history. Well, once you're done with that, it's like, now what? And so I thought, well, I'm giving out a lot of creative writing assignments. Maybe I should be doing more of those myself. And so I just kind of parlayed writing um, goofy short pieces, um, first for newspapers and magazines, and then later with the dawn of the internet, because um, this is way back in the 90s, um, right. you know, pieces for like humor sites. So I, like landing a piece on McSweeney's was like a high water moment for me. Um, I started doing that. And then at some point, you know, like slaving over a um, 600 word humorous essay is satisfying and fun and a kick, but... <laughs> You know, like at some point you, you're like, okay, maybe a longer project. And so we had recently, because of my wife, who um, worked as a books editor for um, Dark Horse Comics, which is um, in Portland, Oregon, essentially, we'd moved to Portland, Oregon. And so I didn't know too much about the city. And I um, started researching it. And I thought, you know, there's room for a book about the city's civic 
um, history, basically. And I, I couldn't find a title really like I wanted to read, but I did find a publisher that had other books like the one I wanted to read for other cities, like New Orleans, um, New York's boroughs, Los Angeles, um, that kind of thing. And so I pitched a book, which I had no business pitching, which was basically a civic and architectural um, history of the city. And it got accepted. And so then I had to go ahead and write it and take the photos for it. And this book, which was called An Architectural Guidebook to Portland, it did get picked up by like Oregon um, State University Press, which was nice. So it was a university press book um, eventually. Um, but it wasn't like, it was kind of a one-off for me. I didn't really want to spend all of my time focusing on architecture. Keep in mind, this is like a a regional book of a limited interest, right? Like not everybody's <laughs> going to be interested in a book like this, but it did kind right. of give me the, um, it kind of opened up my eyes a little bit to like, oh, I could like try different things. You know, I could, and since I'm a teacher, why am I not writing for kids? Like that seems like the natural thing to do since I'm already doing it in my classroom. And so I kind of combined some of the humor that I've been writing beforehand for essays and some of the larger pieces like the book uh, that I had done. And I was like, well, why don't I write some nonfiction, some kids, goofy kids nonfiction. Um, and as a result, I kind of started writing books like, you know, there's the Pocket Guide to Mischief, there's the Big Book of Gross Stuff, there's um, <laughs> there's the Pocket Guide to Games, there's the Big Book of Spy Stuff, um, just kind of title after title. They were all so much fun to work on, I can't tell you. Uh, but, you know, that was, uh, that kind of led me down a path where I eventually thought, well, I've, now I've written a number of nonfiction works should I try fiction? And at that point, um, I realized you kind of need an agent. Like I've been faking it to this point in my writing career, mm -hmm. but to make, to make a connection with a legit fiction publisher, you need someone to sort of hand you off. And so I, I did get an agent that they were able to place a um, book with Disney. Um, that was the Drake equation that came out, gosh, um, probably eight years ago, I think. And um, I was thrilled, you know, it was interesting. It, I've, there was a, when that book came out, 2016, I guess, it came out with another couple in the season because every um, publisher has a season, right? They have their spring books, their fall books. And so when um, Disney came out, it was Disney Hyperion was the name of the, um, the imprint then. Um, it came out with like another four or five or six titles and they were really, <laughs> basically, I got lost before I even like really hit the bookstores with it. I got lost in the mix, I feel like a little bit. And so the book did okay, like it, earned enough. Um, it didn't earn like enough to merit the sequel that I'd been planning on. And so I was like, oh, like that was weird. Like I had a fiction book, major publisher, got some royalties. That was nice. Um, had an advance. But is that really the right, is that, am I playing to my strengths? Is this the way to go? Um, I wasn't really sure. And then um, a little time passed, I worked some other projects and my, it, it, this sounds horribly supercilious and, um, I beg your pardon for phrasing things like this, but my agent, again, anytime I say my agent, I make it, I sound like this hopelessly, like, <laughs> I just sound like someone who I would abhor and uh, there it is. So, <laughs> anyway, my agent said, hey, have you ever thought about writing a choose your own adventure? And I was like, huh, short hmm. answer, no. Uh, as a as a person who, I'm 62, or I strike that, sorry, I'm 61, I overestimated myself. I'm 61, so I was, um, just an undergrad when Choose Your Own Adventures hit the market. But when I was student doing my student teaching and my teaching, I was very aware of Choose Your Own Adventures. In any class of 35 students, let's say, I had big classes, um, there would be like a, a couple, three, four kids who were like buried in these Choose Your Own Adventures. They loved them. So of course I knew what they were. You know, this idea that you are writing a story, the, it's written in the second person, so it's the, mm -hmm. you, you are doing this, you are doing that. And it can sound like a series of commands unless the writer is skilled and kind of pulls you into their um, arc, their story arc. And then it just seems natural. Um, and I was like, no, I've never, I'm very well aware of those titles. They're outrageous. They're funny. Um, they're goofy. I've never like thought to pitch them a story. And the reason my agent was asking me if I had ever thought about it was because they had actually asked about me. I think one of the um, editors had stumbled across one of my books and thought, this guy, he might have what it takes, you know, to like, maybe it's worth asking him. And so um, that editor, Melissa Bounty is her name. Um, and I, by chance, were able to meet in person pretty quickly after that. And we got along famously. We had a lot of, we brought a lot of ideas. We brought some of the exact same ideas to each other, um, which was kind of fun to have someone show up and be like, wait, you're thinking the same thing I'm thinking. Uh, and, you know, I, I, 
wrote a, I wrote a book for them that, that year, I guess it was, it was probably 2018, 2019. Um, and that book is actually um, on ice right now as we wait for um, permission from a, uh, some lawyers and I think Major League Baseball. But it was, a, it was a really instructive process for me to write a Choose Your Own Adventure. And I'm assuming that some of your listeners are familiar with Choose Your Own Adventure, um, some are not. Briefly, um, in addition to being written in the second person, um, it's a storybook. And so what happens is you hit your opening chapter, you, have, you are presented with a situation which requires you to make um, a compelling choice, an interesting choice. Um, and that will lead you into one of two kind of major plot branches. And on the back of each Choose Your Own Adventure, and I could probably hold one up, I don't know if my camera will pick this up very well. Uh, let's see. On the back of it, you'll see a chart um, inevitably. So this is the back, I'm trying to get away from the glare here. This is the back of Time Travel In, which was my, um, the book that precedes Time Travel In 2, which is out now or will be soon. Right. Um, and this, this chart sort of shows the progress you can make through the different um, story threads. Um, well, the, the challenges of writing a story like that are <laughs> manifold. Um, and so what you need to think of are compelling threads. You need a lot of endings um, and you need a lot of um, interesting material that's different so that you're in one, every thread seems fresh. And so with a story like The Drake Equation, which was my novel with Disney, all right. my focus was on that one story arc because that's the way most stories work, right? Like, you know, right. <laughs> I mean, simplistically, you start at A, you have your middle part, and then you conclude it, you know, like, that's it. Like, sure, you can be postmodern, and you can do things, and you can have your flashbacks, and, you know, different, you can change your perspectives within that. Nonetheless, you know, it's a fairly, compared to a Choose Your Adventure, it's a fairly straightforward affair, whereas with a storybook, where you're presented or even challenged with this choice, um, then you're sort of like, moving of your own volition through the book. And it's wonderful. These books are wonderful for um, kids who are looking for empowerment, whether they know it or not. It's wonderful for kids who are reluctant readers because you don't feel like you have to start on page one and then work your way through to the end of the book, which is, you know, that in and of itself is a daunting um, challenge for kids who aren't interested in reading. Yeah. So what are you, as, as writing a choose your own adventure uh, on, under their signature, yeah. um, how much freedom do you have as an author to tweak a story or even have some say over the illustrators, for instance, as well? That's a great question because a lot rides on the art for this and right. for me to think visually and let the art carry weight in the story too, so that I don't have to describe, you know, you walk into a room, do I have to describe it or can I just explain it to the artist and have them uh, illustrate it? In this case, the artist for um, both Time Travel In and Time Travel In 2 is Maria Posado. She's an artist who lives in Barcelona. She has, she's really gifted, really strong lines. And um, she has like a, like a borderline creepy style, which is really great. I hope, sorry, Maria, I called it creepy. I didn't really quite mean that. <laughs> what I mean is there's a macabre element to it sometimes, right? That she can do where um, she's just really, she, she's on Instagram. I, you know, we can share her link later. Uh, she's, she's perfectly suited, I think, to mature, for the material because she's also funny. And so there's, the combination of the humorous elements and then the sometimes kind of scary stuff. Um, not, and when I say scary, I say that advisedly. So for example, you asked about um, the license, the artistic license as a writer. Okay. Right. So with, um, with Time Travel In, as I was writing it, I had these flights of fancy, these preposterous things that I, I was thinking up of. And I thought, am I going too far? I kept feeling like I was going too far. And I didn't say that out loud though to my editor until she said to me, you know, you could push it further. You know, you could push the, you can go further than you are. And I was thinking, you mean further than the multiverse and time travel and the, you know, going back in time and teaching, uh, you know, <laughs> Romans, ancient Romans about the fact that their numbering system lacks like, you know, uh, a little certain panache. Uh, like I had all these like obscure, sometimes obscure and sometimes really like far out ideas. And she was like, no, 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 you can go well beyond those bounds. And I was like, oh, so you're basically saying I have complete freedom. I mean, within the bounds of a middle grade novel, right? So there is, um, there is a sequence, for example, at Time Travel In, where the trio, Astrid and her two, Astrid is the protagonist, you, the reader, are Astrid, um, a young woman, aged 11, 12, um, and with her two sidekicks, uh, Damien and Trent, you go on various peregrinations, travels, if you will, and uh, in one of them, uh, the kids go to a world that has been, there's a link that's been established between Earth and this 
world where trophy hunting of mythical creatures is allowed. So trophy hunters from Earth have this like secret way of getting to this place. And um, people, as it turns out, trophy hunters from many worlds, many worlds come to this place and try to like bag a, you know, name it anything from a leprechaun to a basilisk. And then they try to, you know, mount their heads or you know, whatever trophy they want to take from said, you know, victim is fine. And uh, in one of my um, choices, the kids have an option of sort of asking questions of like, this is a kind of a classic like D&D &D thing, right? You go somewhere, mm -hmm. there's, there's a character there. Do you want to engage them in conversation? Well, the kids, if they choose to, if the reader chooses to dawdle and engage in conversation with someone hoping, hoping to elicit some intelligence, the problem is they're in a place where people come to hunt and bag prey. Long story short, you as the character have your, you get hit by a blow dart, you are knocked, you're paralyzed, you are holding still, and then basically a baboon, an extraterrestrial baboon with a skin problem comes up and politely, delicately, removes your head it's painless but you, they remove your head because that's going to be and that's like the end like that so if you, if you prattled on too long in this particular choice and that was an unfortunate end it's kind of grim but and by the way i should point out that's the probably the most like grim uh <laughs> ending in that particular book but uh i was like oh and that was perfectly that was perfectly fine no one asked me not to do that um and i right. felt like i was sort of encouraged in that direction in a way i don't mean to blame my editor for um, having the main character decapitated at the end. When you write a choose your own adventure, is it true that there's like a like a, a true line, like a true story through there, and then there's <clears throat> alternative? How does that work? No, that's a that's a good question. So in some cases, um, I'll just stick with time travel in for an instance. Uh, for an instant, excuse me. You start. You have your opening chapter. Um, it, right. You have your opening sequence. You make you make a choice, and from there, you can also in some threads go to one more choice and then you're done. Like with a happy ending even. Like you only got two choices and you're out. Which is to say then you would go back to the start and be like, okay, well, what if I had chosen the other thing? Which is, this is the kind of replay, the instant replay you do with these books a lot, right? You're kind of keeping track of where you were. Okay, I played that one out. Now what would have happened if I had gone the other way? So what I just described is a very short story arc. Now in any book, and you can have as many as 24, 40 endings in one of these books or fewer or more. Um, right. you're going to want to have some viable ones to read like a true story thread for a novel. Like for, I was describing the Drake equation, my earlier novel. So you'll have like a three, like that kind of three play act, right. Or three act play, I should say, um, where you have, um, the, the classic story elements where you are building to something pretty amazing. And then there's a denouement after the end and you're, this will be a multi-chapter part of the choosing your own adventure so you mm. you went along and along and along and finally you got to the end of that one and lo and behold it had maybe it had like eight choices along the way to get to that particular right. thing you could call that like the one true story i don't it's certainly a longer and maybe more complex and compelling storyline than the one where you just kind of were like and you went out a side door and oops you're done <laughs> um with those little short side doors can also end in more ambiguous more ambiguous ways or even unpleasant ways um, I think one easy out that writers like me might think when they start writing a choose your own adventure is that like, you just have people die constantly, right? Like this, uh, there's this sort of like gratuitous, like, and then they die in yet another like fresh, but still deathly way. And it's like, no, nah, you can't, you know, and there, there, there's probably a number of classic pitfalls that I'm um, choosing your adventures, uh, writers can make. Another one is not having compelling choices, right? Like you come to especially early on you need to have like action driven good real like viable choices and then you can get to kind of more nuanced ones later once you kind of establish things a little bit so for example um there is a gentleman um, steve tanner i believe is his name who um posts he's a historian sort of choosing an adventure and he'll post kind of fun endings from the dozens and dozens of books that he has and that choose your adventure is published choose goes published and there, it's fun just to see these sort of like random endings and or choices, I should say, where it's like, well, what would have led to that? And one of them that I saw, I feel like just the other week was he posted this. Um, it was like, you, you just thought you're going outside, you're leaving the house. Do you choose a parasol for to, to reduce sun glare or an umbrella for the rain? And I, and that's it. And I was like, what? This is like the most. <laughs> 
<laughs> the most me seemingly meaningless choice and kind of a boring one, right? It's kind of like, do you take the red door or the yellow door? That kind of thing, which seems right. pretty low stakes and not very interesting. But I was like, ah, the genius of that is what led up to that was probably pretty great. And that imbued this choice with actual meaning, right? Where the, the reader who's making the choice is like, oh, well, I, I'm five choices in on this thread. It matters. I don't know how it matters. Right. I haven't read that particular book yet. Um, but uh, that kind of, it, this may sound preposterous to somebody on the outside looking in, but I was like, ah, the nuance, the, you know, the Zen cone like uh, simplicity of the yeah, deceptive uh, aspect of this. Um, I really quite enjoyed that. So um, back to your question, though, about choices, you know, you don't want anything that's just like dumb. Um, you know, but you do sometimes want to, you want to present kids with adult choices if possible. So for example, um, and cliches aren't cliches yet when you're a reader and you're 10, 11 or 12. And so within reason, I was like, ah, cause I was always trying to serve away from anything cliched. And then once in a while I'd be like, eh, maybe I would allow one. So for example, the, the first book that I uh, wrote for Choose Your Adventure, which is on ice for the moment, I think, um, had to do with some time travel where the character has the option He's a, uh, this is his name's Mo, he's Moberg. He's a professional baseball player who really did exist. He really was a spy in World War II. There really was a movie uh, in which, um, what's called The Catcher is a Spy, um, where um, Paul Rudd plays Moberg, the actual baseball player, and portrays his spying career um, in the European theater. Anyway, in my story, <clears throat> Berg voyages into Heisenberg. So there's a German physicist named Heisenberg who in real life was trying to come up theoretically with an atom bomb before the Americans did. In my story, it turns out he's not working on an atom bomb at all. He's working on a time machine. Moberg gets access to it because, and he's able to go back in time, but he has to quickly choose a date because Gestapo agents are coming. And so he's like, what's the smart play here? And so he chooses 1919 um, and he's going to be, he's where he is is close to Vienna. So that'll be his location. And he hits it and goes back in time to 1919. Why did he do that? Because Mo Berg in real life was very smart. He went to Princeton. He spoke, I think, a dozen languages. He was a language scholar and he knew history inside and out. So in 1919 Vienna, he goes to the city. He looks for a painter, a young struggling painter, um, who in our timeline is going to flunk out of art school and develop a nasty anti-Semitic streak um, mm. and cause trouble. Of course, that's Adolf Hitler. In my version, you've got some choices now, you know? Sure, you could try to kill Hitler. This is leading up to the cliche, right? right. You could go back in time for an adult. How many times have we heard this? Would you kill Hitler? Would you kill Hitler as a young person? As a, eh. uh, of course I would, I guess. But then you have to murder somebody. How do you do that? Um, and so Mo Berg now, who is Jewish in real life and now has this choice, he goes back and um, he tries to um, become Hitler's patron. Like, he's like, I will sponsor your artistic endeavors you know you will progress through the vienna school of art my only catch is that while i am paying your way you have to go visit this gentleman once or twice a week talk to him for an hour or so each time and you have to continue that for the next three years right the gentleman he's asking hitler to visit young hitler he's not he's a late teenager i think or early 20s is um sigmund freud jewish huh. Pretty well known in 1919, not quite yet like Sigmund Freud, you know, like Sigmund Freud. Uh, and so Hitler then is getting psychoanalysis basically by his own volition. And he's being with a Jewish therapist. We're thinking, well, okay, this could actually, uh, can you rehabilitate this person? Of course, there will be a choice where it's like, eh, on the other hand, you could just take a shortcut and like try to murder the guy. Does the reader have to have read time travel in the first yeah. book in order to appreciate the second book? That's what I was worried about. I was like, well, how would we, and then I was like, oh, it's pretty simple. It's the same, you know, the, the kid, the idea is that, um, Astrid has, I should look at my own, like kind of set up for, this is a file that I wrote in 2018 when I started with, um, time travel in this is, this is the first thing I wrote for time travel. in. I found the document before this interview. Um, keeping in mind that you write it as you, right? You do this, do that. So your name is Astrid, the aforementioned Astrid. Mm -hmm. You arrive with your dad at a Wisconsin motel owned by your mysterious grandmother. There you meet two boys, but lose both your parents. 
your mom had preceded you in the move and your dad gets lost in the course of the first chapter. Um, you need to find them. That's your goal. Like that's what needs to happen in this book um, in, for time travel in, excuse me. Uh, in your quest for clues, you find hints in your grandmother's diary about her scientific research. She used to work um, in intelligence for the US government, unsurprisingly. And uh, you need to stop an unspecified but catastrophic, catastrophic thing called the doomsday event um, you then commence. And so you kind of, you have to make some choices about like, am I, am I looking for mom or dad, first of all? So that's kind of like the weird, like which parent is your favorite? I don't know. Like if you, if you're lucky enough to have two, like pick one, but anyway, that's your choice. You kind of like go take it from there. Um, so that you have this compelling action that kind of gets you into that for time travel too. Um, there's something similar to this. I won't like bother you with the setup, but Astrid and the boys are playing a board game. Ogre, you're familiar with Dungeons and Dragons. Their game is Ogres and Oubliettes. Uh, <laughs> so they're enjoying Ogres and Oubliettes in the front lobby because Astrid lives with her family at the inn. It is, in fact, an inn. Um, and then um, hijinks commence, basically. Um, and they pull in um, a lot of things like Schrodinger's cat. And uh, there's a lot of Dungeons and Dragons sort of jokes in one of the threads. Um, and so I have some fun with that. Uh, that's kind of the multiverse. There's sort of the multiverse world and there's sort of the time travel um, world because you kind of break out and then I'm hoping to kind of bridge between them at some point without blowing the reader's mind. Um, it is a tricky game though, like to, to sort of stack the story in such a way that you never repeat something. Everything always makes sense within its thread. Every thread's going to branch though, like it may be five, six pages in, sometimes it's the first page on, the, on it and you'll, you'll make a break. Um, and it all has to work out. Like you can't, like they all have to be, um, logical that is to say nothing that's happening in one thread can completely contradict what's happening in another one right so in other words like right. your father can't be an overwhelm like a tyrant in one thread but he's a pretty nice guy in the other one you know what i mean no it's like that's that breaks your character logic right and so right. it seems like all bets are off but actually you have to abide by it. it's just like for people who write um, for authors or your um, uh, folks that you um, chat with there has to be rules of logic, twisted or as fun as they are, that apply in the world that you're creating in, right? And so, um, so that makes it a bit of a challenge. But yeah, it's a. It's a Do you see uh, a resurgence to uh, books right now? You know, <clears throat> it's tricky because as a layperson, all I have is like my experience, and then I'm kind of obviously like consuming media and kind of getting the land right. that way. So. Um, but the problem is like the lay of the land is, for me is like, well, I get Ron Charles, who's a re book reviewer for the Washington Post. I get his weekly newsletter and I'm getting, you know, publishers weekly, you know, and I'm getting the latest news there. I work my full time job during the day is for a publisher. I'm the managing editor at a social studies publisher. Um, mm. And so like I'm immersed in the world of publishing. And so I feel like books are viable and they're generating revenue and, and great ideas and they're creating education, but we're also, a, we've been in a sea change really for, I mean, really almost 20 years, um, call it 18. Um, I, I remember when eBooks came out and it was like, oh my gosh, this heralds the end of books. And it's like, no, nah, really, really didn't yeah. did it. Um, and so I don't want to um, get too worried. On the other hand, there's no question it's something like AI, you know, where I'm like, right. Oh, well, chat GBT or BARD, which is the Google, basically the Google version of it, it sounds disconcertingly like BART. Um, these are things where it's like, hey, can you write me a 6,000 word uh, short story about this topic? Bling, there it is. It's like, whether it's any good or not, or makes any sense at all, like, never mind that. Right. And it's only going to get better over time, right? And so I feel like there's, uh, it's a source of concern and interest. I've been reading science fiction all my life, so I'm not like maybe caught as quite as flat footed as um, I could have been. Um, but to answer your question, I'm also in um, a rarefied place, I feel like, because I'm close to Portland. I work part time just for kicks. I shouldn't say just for kicks, but I work part time at Powell's Books to get me to get out of the house. I work there 16 hours, excuse me, 16 hours a week. And Powell's Books is the largest bookstore in the really in the United States. And it occupies an right. entire city block in downtown Portland, but there's also ancillary stores in the Portland metro region that are colossal. You know, they would be the biggest bookstore. So where, where I worked was on the east side of town, the Powell's there. That would be the biggest bookstore in the rest of the state if it wasn't for the gigantic, like, you know, mothership downtown, that kind of thing. 
So um, there's a lot of readers. There's a lot of creatives. There's just creatives around here. I mean, you probably, I, I cannot be the first person you've interviewed from Oregon, I feel like, because there's even like within where we moved is a small town. We just moved here a couple of years ago. Jonathan Case is a wonderful um, cartoonist here. He's uh, had some great success. I don't mean, I'm not, sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm not like selling you on Jonathan, but you know, we've got creatives here in our small town. We've got writers and authors and people who are vested. We are, we are 10th population, 10,000, but there's an independent bookseller in town. Um, and I feel like that's not always the case though, right? Wherever you go in the United right. States. And so I'm kind of, I'm not in the best position actually to speak to it, I realize. Like what I want to say is, yeah, of course, books were never, they're never going anywhere. Ever since Gutenberg stamped that first page, you know, we're good to go. Um, I don't know that. Um, right. But in this moment in time, I mean, I'm employed full time in the industry. My avocation is writing books and having fun with it. Um, so far, so okay. I don't want to be oblivious. Um, right. It's really, it's a fascinating question. I, I don't know, but are kids reading like they used to? Anecdotally, no. Like you talk to, like maybe you run into this, you bump into a, just a generic adult, a parent, a grandparent, whoever. Well, you know, kids don't even read anymore. You know, like I hear that a lot um, just from right. like, sort of like, what do you do? I write and edit and, you know, this and that. Well, do books even exist? Some someone exhibited shock the other month that I had a library card, or I had a library book. Is that a library right. book? It is. Libraries are still around. I'm not joking, by the way. And this was in Portland, and I was like, wow. "Yeah, this is a person in command of their faculties. Like, this is you know what I mean. This is like a person out in the world, seemingly normal, shocked that like so, someone would would have a library book and that library books existed." And I was like. Yeah, I've got the card and everything. You can go. It's free. <laughs> you know, it's free. They have a lot of neat stuff there. You know, it's not just books. Right. You know, they've got. Uh, so maybe having said that, now I can see clearly that we're doomed. It really comes down to also when you make bring, you know bring it up is like if children see their parents reading, then they're going to end up being readers. Absolutely. So, yeah, it, it definitely behooves parents to actually like just have a library. Something about having a bookshelf in your home. Yeah, it's full of books Agre is always good. Absolutely. I mean, just seeing the your backdrop is like invigorating for me. I'm like, yeah. ah, yeah, that's like, a, you know, it's like a tonic for my eyes. Um, and you're right, role modeling though, like, there's nothing. There's no point in even like overemphasizing it because it's everything. Um, well, so listen, Bart, if people want to learn more about you, where's the, where's the best place they could go to? I. I hesitate, hesitate to say my socials, but I, I am on Facebook. It's a public account. I'm on threads. I encourage people to go to threads and blue sky and not Twitter, but I am on Twitter because uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, I refuse to cede C E D E space to the um, Nimrods, shall we say? Uh, so for the moment I'm still there, but I think like you all probably be more just sort of, sort of like glance at the news, retweet, maybe the odd good affirming or funny item and then move along. Mm -hmm. um, and then my website, thank you for sharing it. Barking.net, which, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you. So listen, Bart, you're going to have to come back on when you have your new other book coming out because you're always having a book published. This is amazing. Yeah, yeah. I got to I gotta get cracking on time travel in three so that uh, I can come back on. It was an absolute pleasure, Barney. Um, really appreciate the time and um, really enjoyed meeting you. Yeah, thank you for coming on. This has been great. society is about to form as far as I can see. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, let me do the intro. This was all just the pre-show banter. See, this is, gives me something to edit and put in the post-credit scene. See what I Okay. Do. This is all B-roll. Okay. This is all B-roll stuff. <laughs> I just use my best material. <laughs>